Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the last edition of Philosophical Geometry. Um, it's time to go back to regular life. <laughs> so, but it has been a true pleasure doing this with everyone over the course of the last 40 days. Uh, I can't believe we've actually done 30 different classes, which is kind of mind boggling uh, to say the least. But um, I expect that I will be doing a few more of these types of things, but not necessarily on a daily basis anymore. So, uh, but uh, I'm excited to present to you what we have uh, to go through today. So I've actually figured out a way also to, uh, to make it so that you don't have to be reading Da Vinci style backwards if you're on Instagram and, um, and be able to still see the presentation. So first of all, I'm gonna start off the presentation with a quick video from, um, from my uh, YouTube channel, which is just Robert Edward Grant. And you can find everything of all these classes on uh, my YouTube channel, as well as on my, um, on my website. So uh, my website just being robertedwardgrant.com. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with this quick video, which many of you probably already know. The iconic Vitruvian Man drawn circa 1490 by the great Leonardo da Vinci. It's probably the most famous image of all time. And yet for over five centuries, no one has noticed the encoded within it astounding knowledge of the great pyramid of Giza. Polymath Robert Grant recently observed that the angle from the navel to the top corner of the square exactly matches the side slope angle of the pyramid. Aware that his cryptologist friend, Alan Green, had discovered precision sacred geometry connections to the pyramid hidden in the cover of Shakespeare's sonnets, Grant asked him to investigate da Vinci's masterpiece with the same mathematical rigor. What they found challenges our entire concept of what this enigmatic work of art is really about. It's widely known that the Great Pyramid embodies the ratio of the radiuses of the Earth and Moon. But Green realized that by inscribing a circle within Da Vinci Square and raising that circle so its center coincides with the center of the Vitruvian Man Circle at the navel, six perfect pyramid cross-sections are revealed along with an exact geometrical match of the Earth-Moon pyramid relationship. Da Vinci states explicitly in the backwards mirrored text surrounding his image that its proportions are exact integer ratios of the whole man. And he's cut his man in 14 places clearly identifying those proportions. In addition, he says, decrease the height of man by 1 14th, a second veiled reference to the Horus Eye myth in which Seth cuts Osiris' body into 14 parts. Now, the magic. Da Vinci's lines reveal a perfect blueprint of the internal structure of the pyramid's chambers. Only the queen's chamber seems to be missing. But is it? Queen Isis, mourning the cutting of her husband's body into 14 parts, represents the 14 phases of the waning moon. Her reconstituting Osiris' body represents the 14 phases of the waxing moon. Da Vinci has precisely identified the presently known subterranean queen's and king's chambers, the ground level of the pyramid, its defining side angle, and its mathematical relationship to earth and moon, centuries before these were supposedly known. Which begs the question, do his upper lines represent presently unknown chambers? Da Vinci seems to be telling us the Great Pyramid hides a deeper esoteric symbolism than has ever been suspected. A blueprint of man's unfolding spiritual journey 
through the sacred energy centers in the spine, known as the chakras. Perhaps finding these inner chambers in ourselves is our ultimate purpose, and the Great Pyramid but a metaphor for the true measure of mankind. Okay, so uh, let's get into the presentation today. Uh, I'm going to give a very quick overview of what we went through last time so it can really sink in as well into your minds. Um, but basically, what I'm going to, to take you through today is, is essentially what I've been finding and discovering related to da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. And what you just saw in that video is kind of the front end of that. I'm going to turn down the radio a little bit so you guys can hear me better. One second here. Just one second. Okay. There we go. So there's a deep message in this that I'm very excited to share with you today. And I don't think that it would have been possible for, I don't know, a, a regular art historian or something to, to find this uh, very clear encryption uh, because the art historian would have had to have had pretty, pretty uh, extensive knowledge of uh, mathematics and not just the kind that you learn in school, but a very particular type of resonance-based uh, mathematics. So there's a very deep message in here and obviously it does relate to the pyramid. Um, one of the things I noticed about this about a year ago was that this angle from the navel to here, from measuring from this point to here, was exactly 51.84 uh, degrees. And that if you measure from here, it would be 38.16. Uh, and 0.3816 times 360 equals 137. And so uh, 5884 is the most iconic number that people would recognize related to the pyramid. And then what Al and I found together was that all the lines that da Vinci had drawn uh, as horizontal lines along the torso of, of the Vitruvian man matched precisely the ground level and each of the chambers that are known chambers and even candidly predicts unknown chambers still yet to be discovered. And basically what we have found as well is that with the aid of the SCAN project that, uh, that, that went uh, forward in 2017. In fact, it was performed the week that I was in Egypt in 2017, in October, the same night, in fact. We saw the, the muon scans that were sitting inside the Queen's Chamber. They identified right up here another hidden missing chamber. So we posit that da Vinci has predicted where there is existing another chamber. Now, you might think, well, Da Vinci was never known to have gone to Egypt. Well, actually, inside this very large book uh, that I purchased when I was at the Vatican, uh, it tells a, a very different story that Da Vinci, in fact, worked for the Sultan of Cairo and that this story was well-documented and can be found in the Codices and the Codice Atlantico in particular, where it talks of him working for the, the Devet Dar who is like the lieutenant to the Sultan of, uh, of Cairo. And actually it says Sultan of Babylon Cairo. And it, it actually points out and says it's not the Babylon that's on the River Chober, but rather it's the Babylon that sits inside of Cairo. And there is a section of Cairo today still referred to as Babylon. And there's a fortress there. And so da Vinci went to work for the Mamluk Sultan, uh, who uh, his name was Kate Bey. Um, and Kate Bey is very well known as a philosopher king among the, amongst the Mamluk sultans. And Mamluk actually means bodyguard. So you can imagine there's a whole culture of people that consider themselves like bodyguards. And uh, da Vinci worked for him on a very secret project that was related to architecture. And in, this, in, this, uh, uh, in, in these passages, it basically also refers to him traveling through 
uh, Armenia and traveling through Turkey on the way to Egypt. And then he finally says, we finally arrived in Cairo. And uh, it also references the Taurus Mountain. And that, that is widely understood, uh, and, and many art historians know about the Taurus Mountain discussion because in this same passage, he talks about going inside a cave inside this mountain. And there, there were about three to four years of life that da Vinci lived that uh, is, is absent, conspicuously absent from the record uh, from 1482 until 1486. And, and so uh, in reading this, what I realized was that the reference to Taurus Mountain was actually an encryption. It was referencing the Ross Tau Mountain. It even talks of it being made of limestone and being incredibly beautiful and touches the sky. And the reference to the cave inside of the Ross Tau Pyramid, which is just Taurus backwards in Greek, um, is actually a reference to the king's chamber. And he talks about having both excitement and fear when he looks inside the king's chamber. It even discusses how he had to bend over with one hand on the knee and then walk back and forth. Well, because the passageway into the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid is only 39 and a half inches high. I know because I measured it. And that is exactly how you have to walk in. It's about 20 or so feet to get into the king's chamber and you have to be slunched over and, and, and you can imagine that that's about the same height as a bar. So you can still stand on your feet, but you're kind of like wobbling back and forth, just as da Vinci describes. So uh, we have very strong evidence now, myself and the researchers on our team, to suggest, not only suggest, but to point to da Vinci actually having gone to Egypt and having worked in Egypt. And a lot of his fanciful commentary that is listed in these passages is actually very emblematic of the way he does his encryptions. So with that in mind, in the case of the Vitruvian man, what da Vinci was supposed to have done is square the circle. And as I talked about yesterday, the blue square would be a perimeter squaring, which is a first dimensional squaring, and the red square would be an area squaring, but what he drew was the green square. And the green square is neither the blue nor the red. In fact, it's very far off. Now, as a mathematician, you would look at this and say it's not even close. Well, Walter Isaacson says that da Vinci studied how to square a circle for more than 10 years. And come on, he's one of, if not the, one of, uh, listed as probably one of the most incredible geniuses of all time. And, and for 10 years, and he couldn't figure out how to draw a square the right size, I highly doubt that. So what exactly did he do? Well, one of the things that I noticed, and if you look at that video I just played, the length on the video, if you go on YouTube, is actually four minutes, 31 seconds, because they chop one second off. The length of the video even, which I, would, which I did a year ago, uh, before I knew any of this that I'm about to present to you, is actually a video that is four minutes and 32 seconds, which, of course, what I then later learned uh, when we did the full measurement of the accurate document is that it's exactly 4.32 inches from the navel to the circle. Now these are the exact dimensions that da Vinci himself drew by his own hand. And that gives us 8.64 inches for a diameter. And then we have uh, a square that's not really a square at all. In fact, it veers off down here at the bottom and it does it in a very weird way because it doesn't make it a real perfect square at all. Now there's a reason why he did that, I believe, and I'm gonna present that today uh, in a lot more detail. But also one of the major reasons here is I believe it was showing dimensionality. So that it's done exactly in just the precise way to look as if it is a three-dimensional cube. And I'm just looking at it from one of its faces called on farce, and then off to the side. Your Instagram live just ended, just so you know. Okay, my Instagram live, I wonder what happened there. Okay, we'll do this again. All right, I don't know why that is cut off. It seems like my Facebook is still working. Okay, good. So basically what we have here is you'll notice that this 864 shows up all over the place. The same diameter of 864 because when you measure the da Vinci square, which is right here, this da Vinci square has a diagonal, right, of exactly 10 inches. 
And the way you derive that is you can take uh, point, uh, 4.32 and then divide that by one over 0.864 and that gives you five, right? So that informs exactly the size of the square. And then I went ahead and drew a circle around this just to see what else is going on because whenever you create a square, you're also creating a circle around it from a natural perspective, nature does that. And by the same token, I draw also another square inside the Da Vinci circle. Now, you'll also notice that I moved the square up just to see what correspondences were there. And the square, it's the same dimensions, but the original Da Vinci square is down here and pushed to the base of the circle so that the top of the square is just coming up above the edge of the circle right here. Now, all of this being very deliberate, Da Vinci being a very, very famous cryptologist, right? He, he did all of this type of stuff in encryption. And what I noticed when I did that was that you got some very, very important uh, numbers of incidents here. So the circumference of the circle with 8.64 inches as its diameter is very close to the Euler number. So 27.143, and you'll find that, that these exact numbers are matching the size of the sun and its diameter, which is 864,000 miles, and its radius, which is 432,000 miles. And its circumference is, is uh, 2.71 million miles. So it is remarkably close, right? And the other thing that's interesting is once you raise this uh, square, or once you have this square here that da Vinci drew, and you put a circle around that, then it has a uh, circumference of 3.416, 31.416. So uh, that's pi times 10. Now, that's interesting because now we have the two most important transcendental irrational numbers that exist. One being the Euler number, which limits wave propagation and is used in interest calculation. It's how banks calculate compound interest. And the other being pi, which we all know makes circles. Now, Euler makes squares and pi makes circles. So what we find here is that you know, Alan said to me, who I work very closely with, he says, well, you know, we need to be able to measure the original. What if we can't measure the original, even though we know that this is to scale and it says it's to scale and Toshin made this document and Toshin is a very expensive book uh, publishing house that, uh, that does this. And I had actually bought this book that's probably 20 years old. I bought it about 20 years ago and I forgot that I actually took the Vitruvian Man page out and framed it and I had it sitting in a closet somewhere because I have another larger version of Vitruvian Man in my office and I've had it here you know, as, as long as I can remember. And I forgot that I had this two scale uh, version of it that's exactly the scale that Da Vinci drew uh, in my closet. And so then I went and took it out of my closet, took it out of the frame and sure enough, I measured it and it was these perfect measurements. But what if the original is slightly different? Maybe it's one millimeter or a tenth of a millimeter off. Well. I then decided to do the same analysis using one as my radius and two then becomes the diameter. So I'm just looking for the proportionality to see what happens. Well, when I did that, it doesn't change anything because it still points to 0.864 everywhere, right? The whole thing is 0.864 because now the diagonal becomes 2.3184, which is derived as two times one over 0.864. So 864 is a fundamental mathematical constant and a ratio. The other thing that I noticed is that what used to be pi in, in um, you know, this, this relationship now goes from 31.4156, uh, or sorry, 31.4, uh, 31.416 uh, as the circumference now becomes 7.272205, which is actually when you multiply that number by 360, it gives us phi squared perfectly, being 261.8. So 2.618 is phi squared. Now that's just multiplied by 100, of course. It also introduces this new concept of tau, right? Tau being two pi. So two pi divided by one over alpha in its decimal measurement equals 0.864, which Euler divided by pi also equals that ratio of 0.864. Now, one other thing to remember is we have 86,400 seconds in one day. Now, that's kind of remarkable in and of itself. Now, this is a picture that I drew five years ago having nothing to do with the Vitruvian Man. I was trying to understand the separation between light and darkness that exists uh, for us in our world of dualistic light. 
And, and gravity and electromagnetism was what I was trying to understand further. And you know, I do a lot of work with physicists. And, and so I, I wrote up here a world of dark sun and a world of light sun. So the idea was that for every um, electron and for every, uh, for every proton, there must be an antiproton and an anti-electron or what's called as a, a, a positron. And so I was trying to find the ratios of those two things. Now, interestingly, I wrote on here 864 because that was what I posited the relationship to be. And I wrote on here, and this is again five years ago, I wrote on here that the circumference of a circle with a diameter of 864 would actually be um, 2,714. So it's the same number, right, as on the other page on the Vitruvian Man. And then you cut that in half to find the inscribed square and the inscribed circle, inscribed square, inscribed circle. And so it basically takes you down this tunnel where you see these very important numbers, 864, 432, 610.9, 216, right? These are all numbers you'll find over and over and over again in all of our imperial measurement systems. And then by the same token here on pi, we've got 1,000. And then 3142, and I called this the world of pi units, and I called this the world of Euler units. And, and so 432, by the way, squared, so the radius of the sun squared, taking off three zeros, equals the speed of light in miles per second. And so that's basically what this is. 1.864 times 10 to the fifth is light speed. Now, I also pointed out here that pi over 432 is that same 727, which when I multiply that by 360 gives me phi squared. And then Euler divided by 432 gives me roughly tau, which is two pi. So that is interesting that all of this was identical. Now, where this took me next was here, which is that basically using this world of Euler concept, and I put this all in my computer and measured it against the exact dimensions of the, uh, of the Vitruvian man. So this is the green square is actually the Vitruvian man square. And, and you'll notice that the length on this right here is 707, right here. And then now on this, the green square is 7071, right? And that happens to be the square root of two. Now what you'll notice is that all of these are just doubling math, so you've got you know, 50 is the area of the square, so AS is area of the square, AC is area of the circle, S is the side length, D is the diameter, which are the same, right, because you've got a side length here. This also becomes a diameter for the circle that's inscribed within it. And then you have here, uh, on this square that Da Vinci drew, which is in dark green, of 7071, it has a, um, it, it basically has a circumference, right, of, 30, when, you, when you put a circle around that, that will have a circumference of 31.416, right? It's that same number that I showed you earlier. Another thing that, that came out of this was that on the, on the world of Euler, all the numbers are binary number expansions. So one doubles to two, two doubles to four, four doubles to eight, eight doubles to 16, 3,200, and so on. It will always be that relationship. And as these are doubling here, they're also doubling here as squares, and then these relationships here, right? This is the AC. The AC is AC1 divided by AC2 equals um, uh, one, over, uh, one over two. So this is doubling, right? So 38, 39 doubles to 78 and so on, right? And then the ones that don't have that doubling relationship are always one over square root two. So you could say it's one half or one over root two. So I did the same thing with the pi world, right? And I took the Da Vinci circle, and then inscribe squares and circles and squares and circles within that. And what do I find? Well, I get here the Euler number as the circumference value for the Da Vinci, um, for the, the Da Vinci circle, right? Which is 8.64 inches. And so you just simply derive that as 8.64 multiplied by pi, and that's how you get this circumference, which is very close to the Euler number. And as I talked about yesterday, I then integrated these two and just as the first one, everything that is circles inscribed within squares, inside within circles and squares, et cetera, infinitely, it's always a one over two or one over root two relationship. Now, when I overlap the two together, it's giving me exactly the relationship between each of these is either, um, 
it's, it's, it's either the square root of two times 0.864 exactly, or it's 0.864. And the reason for the difference is you'll see these two are closer and then there's a gap and then they're close and then there's a gap. This is just like spiraling DNA. The DNA does the exact same thing. You know, there's like this gap and you'll see the two double helix basically spiraling over and they're tight, they're, they're more tightly wrapped. So this whole thing is relating now to this relationship of where the da Vinci circle has the Euler number as its circumference and the da Vinci square is inscribed within a circle that has pi as its circumference. This relationship between Euler and pi is super, super advanced. Now, of course, pi was known for thousands of years and we believe Euler was known also, not under the name Euler, but we believe it's been known for a very long time because it's built into the dimensions of the Great Pyramid. But there's something going on here. And of course, Euler over pi equals that relationship as well. I also noticed that all these numbers in absolute values were all very important numbers from root eight to one over root two to um, you know, all of these in here, which are the sun's radius in miles, the moon's radius in miles, the seconds, number of seconds in a day, the binary expansions that I just talked about. You can go over here to this number of area for the circle is pi over four. This is pi over two. This is one times Euler minus two minus one. Now, all of these things are very simple equations. And here's light speed showing up right here too. And these are very simple equations, but interestingly, what clearly da Vinci was trying to do by drawing a simple square and a simple circle is to show us this relationship between Euler and pi and how it actually separates light from darkness. Euler controlling and being what we would refer to as gravity and pi being what we refer to as light and radiation. And it's an endless loop that cycles back and forth. They're equal opposite conditions of the same thing. Now there's a theory uh, known as the Kaluza-Klein theory that for whatever reason, uh, you know, scientists today, physicists today, would say that it ultimately failed. Although it became the father, uh, you could say the mother or father of what is currently referred to as string theory. Um, the thing is, it, they, they refer to it as being proven that it failed, but no one ever proved anything. The only thing is, is that the academic community didn't accept it, although Einstein did accept it. And it basically united electromagnetism together with gravity as emergent conditions of the same phenomenon just opposite conditions. And this is why they both comply with inverse square law uh, that Newton came up with, and they both comply with light speed because they're just opposite conditions of the exact same phenomenon. And, and that is exactly what I believe da Vinci understood here, or he's trying to message of the many things he's messaging to us. So the other thing that I noted was that while I was teaching the, the philosophical geometry class, you may remember that um, we drew together the spiral of Theodorus. And it was on one page and the page on top of it was where I showed how to draw the squaring of the circle. So I went back and looked at the squaring of the circle page and I took a picture of it and I could see it bleeding through. Now this is the second time the spiral of Theodorus had bled through the pages and I'd had some complaints about it before on the Vitruvian man that I drew also. And so I thought, you know, maybe, maybe I should look more closely at this. And proportionally, you can start the, the spiral of Theodorus with one inch, which is what I've done here. And then I overlaid, not the drawing that I made, but I actually overlaid one that you can lift off of the internet. And basically with spiral of Theodorus is you just take one inch and one inch, and then this side length right here will be the square root of two. And then this is this, this one that spirals out from the center here, coming out around like this. So I did exactly that, and we did it together in class. And what I noticed is that there were some bizarre correspondences. First of all, where I landed when I did it in class, I stopped at the square root of 25, and I noticed that it was really close to the median line uh, of, of where the da Vinci man is. And then secondly, I started noticing other correspondences um, where the lines seem to go along the knee right here, right? And so this is the square root of, uh, of 39, this is the square root of 40. So what the spiral of Theodorus is, and spiral of Theodorus, Theodorus actually means God's gift, and the, or Theodorus. Theodorus 
Uh, and what, what this is, is it's basically a mathematical proof that shows that all numbers emerge from the number one. And, and what it's basically saying is that I could take a side length of a right triangle, right triangles all have 90 degrees, and then it will inform root two. I'll take the same one as my unit length on this side, and this will inform root three, and then it'll be root four, root five, root six, root seven, root eight, root nine, and I can keep one as my side value infinitely. And this creates a Fibonacci spiral. And, and I also noticed that there was a point where the spiral of Theodorus was crossing over the green circle by da Vinci, and that happens to be right at 13.7 degrees, which is known as the fine structure constant in mathematics and physics. Um, it's a threshold energy value, 137 is a threshold energy value. And so you see here that the spiral breaks out of the green circle right at 13.7 degrees. And the value of that is exactly radius being 4.32 inches, 18.6624 or light speed in miles per second. Uh, the, the closest whole number squaring of light speed. Another thing I noticed that was kind of bizarre was that the square that was kind of an imperfect square uh, exactly the upper corner of it was matching precisely where da Vinci had drawn. In fact, you can see this bulbous thing sticking out here where he pushed his quill down because if I were to continue this line right here, it would have stopped just shy of where the, uh, where the spiral of Theodorus would basically overlap. So in order to sort of push this out a little bit, he deliberately made a bulbous, it's almost like there's a puncture hole there too, just to fit right through the spiral of Theodorus. So I thought, wow, that is amazing because you know that's not the only correspondence. There are many others as well, like this one right here, where da Vinci's Vitruvian man is sort of caressing right on this, this point, and you're like, where is that going to? Well, it just turns out that's exactly the line for the square root of 31. And 31 is a very important number. Uh, and I've actually analyzed the number 31 in, in what we call rotational symmetry and done videos on it. If you'd like to learn more about that, you can find it on Instagram or Facebook. So I started taking this analysis even further and I've even got some new stuff from yesterday too. And, and basically what I found is that where every place you see these circles, these red circles, there's like a point or angle of incidence. So I noticed that the lines on the legs, right here, crossing over this calf, then right at the ball of the foot, and then on this left foot, right at the heel, perfectly, is exactly where the spiral of Theodorus is. And then it's also crisscrossing the line of the knee right here. So he's basically touching the knee, the knee, the knee, the knee, and the knee, right here, right on the knee cap, in fact. These are all cresting the kneecap, these three, and these two are framing the entire leg, right? Both sides of this being square root of 39 and the square root of 40. So then you combine that with the fact that you've got his upper square right here. That is like really remarkable. Another thing that shows up here, and remember the radius of 432, 4.32 inches, is also matching up with this right here. So one of the lines, which is the square root of 21, is going right up against the hand of the Vitruvian man, right here, and that's landing right at 43.2 degrees. <laughs> so matching exactly the radius. So I, I did it without the spiral of Theodorus first. In fact, I just started looking at all the places I thought seemed conspicuous. You know, all the places in a degree reference that I wanted to understand and what I noticed that all of them were mathematical constants. Every one of them are math constants that are fundamental constants of nature and physics. You know, as an example, landing right on the right side of the foot right here, and this was not related to the spiral of Theodorus, this point right here is exactly at 261.8 degrees. And one of its quaternion reflections that will share, therefore, the same sine, cosine, and tangent values is 98.2 degrees. Um, another one right at the, the, the tip of the toe. This is light speed plus one, right? So it's just one in front of the 86.4. Um, all of these points become very, very fundamental. 
This one right here, 141.6, is actually, you could put three in front of that, and that is pi, right? On this side of the square, the exact angle at the upper corner is at, uh, is at 51.6 degrees versus on this side of the square, right? And that's this, that's this blue line right here, going right through here. This side, it is 51.8 degrees. So then I combine the two to see what kind of references I might find. And this was fascinating to me because what I noticed immediately was that the, the lines that I had drawn, independent of the spiral of Theodorus, were the blue lines that are overlapping the black. So this one right here, right at 243, which is a permutation or like a palindrome uh, of, uh, of the number 432. And then you have 292.5 degrees is 22 and a half. That's also a very important mathematical constant that relates to phi because 222.5 divided by 360 equals phi relationship. And this also is 0.62 of 36. So 22.5 is 0.62 of 36. And then also um, noticing as well that the, um, the line that is here, of course, you know, the eye is drawn, of course, right to these points because his hand is pointing here, first of all. And secondly, it's, it's conspicuously cresting the circle. Um, the other lines, of course, that are matched are this one right here. I didn't put a blue line on it, but there should be a blue line right here as well. So framing this hand, uh, you've got this one, of course, and then this one, strangely, the Vitruvian man is even in the middle, right? So he goes right down the middle. This is a line that is perfectly right at center, right? All the way up until you get to his upper torso, about right here, the line diverges because the Vitruvian man starts to lean to the right side as if he's leaning more to the eye of raw side or the masculine side. And, and what's conspicuous about it is that he's got this part in the hair which is so perfectly straight, you would think that that line should be going through that. Well, actually, the line, the median line does not go through that, which means that the face is not exactly straight. So it's a very, very minute amount off. But what does traverse straight through it is the square root of 25. Another thing that is interesting is root 26 and root 24, framing the head almost like he's wearing some sort of helmet, right? It's like perfect. So I am more than convinced now uh, by looking at this, that this is a frame that da Vinci was using to try to encrypt a lot of information and data on knowledge of mathematical constants that is very, very advanced. Now, I took this another step further, I'll go to the next slide, and I noticed that actually all of the blue lines here that are drawn by da Vinci all lead to points that are fundamental, like the, the, the ball of the foot, the knees, but also lines where you can see indentations or where there's a crisscross line. You know, for example, where this uh, lower torso is meeting with the hip right there. That is exactly where the, uh, the uh, spiral of Theodorus is basically landing and giving us value related to root 34, right? And, and so what I noticed that all of these, where the red circles are right here, right? All of these were fundamental places, even subtleties about where, you know, this line is ending right here and then doing the same thing on this side, right? that all of these blue lines of the spiral of Theodorus are literally informing the structure of the Vitruvian man. Now, this is beyond any kind of argumentation in my mind because there's just way too many. You've got right on the axilla right here, as well as right here, right on this, this vertical line on the elbow, right, which are the, the lines that were used to measure the measure of man and the, and the body right on this finger right over here. And uh, it is truly remarkable that all of this matched up so perfectly. And what it basically shows is that root 2, root 9, root 10, root 11, root 12, 13, 14, 16, 17, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. I mean, all of these numbers are fundamental to our understanding that we, and you can look at it from all the complexity and difficulty from a mathematical standpoint, or you could just stop and say, wait a minute, 
it all is just emerging from the number one. Because if you see out here on the sides, it starts with one. And then you see out here on the sides that the values are all one. They're all one. So, you know, he's given us the complex. He's also given us the simple. And, and that is, you know, his statement is, you know, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Um, I, I could not agree more. So now the other thing I found was that, you know, that 13 over 13.7 that we saw up here, right, which would be right at this point right here where the light is cresting out, right, and coming out. It's also interesting that you'll see the spiral of Theodorus crests over at another place on the green circle right at square root of 25. So this is why it informed for him the five inches of the radius of the square, right, that da Vinci drew. And the, of course, the radius of 4.3 inches. These are all both related to light escaping, right, out of this boundary condition. So let's take that 13.7. Now, I explained this yesterday that 137 is the threshold energy that determines whether or not an electron will emit a photon or it will absorb it. So you could literally say we have a world of reflection spectra or absorption spectra. We look at colors. You know, I'm looking at a big blue umbrella outside. Well, it's not really blue. Uh, that's the reflection that it is. It's, it's actually reflecting blue because it's absorbing all other colors and the place that is the peak absorption is gonna actually be red. So if I lived in a photograph negative world, I'd be looking at a red umbrella and instead of a blue black background, it would probably be a, a pale yellowish background, right? Um, uh, that would be along the orangey sort of spectrum side of things. So we separate light. Light is literally separated between darkness and light along the axis of what I would call the fine structure constant. And you can look this up. There's 137 is the most mysterious number in all of physics. It is known and understood that it is absolutely misunderstood. And the Higgs uh, boson, right, field is actually based on the mathematics of the fine structure constant of one over 137. So alpha, is that, and it is actually called scientifically alpha, and the value is one over 137. That comes out to be 0 0.00729735. Now, what I also noticed was that there was another correspondence because when you're dealing with right triangles, if I have a right triangle and one angle is 13.7 degrees, so that's theta, then the other angle up here would be 90 degrees minus that number, which is 76.3. And that value I immediately recognized as one over omega. Omega is a value of roughly 0.57. It is 0.56714329. And it is a fundamental mathematical constant, but one over omega minus one, so one over omega equals 1.763. So one over omega minus one, so that's a beautifully simple equation. Omega works alongside Euler, by the way, because Euler uh, times omega to the power of omega equals one. So if I, I drew that out, it would be omega Euler to the power of omega equals one. So that means that omega as a mathematical constant is like pi and Euler because it is a, a transcendental number. Now, pi has the same counterpart but not in that number, it's a close number, it's not 0.56714, rather it is 0.539, okay? And that 0.539 does the same thing. So I could take pi times, I, I gave that value N, sometimes it's referred to as Lebesgue constant and it determines how water freezes. So N to the power of, uh, to the power of pi equals, right, um, or rather, it's, it's n times pi to the power of n equals 1.00, okay? So this is the triangle that is basically being told to us in this light. So I thought I would, you know, it's, it's the way to depict a triangle that is this, you know, kind of go back to trigonometry class. You can use Thales' theorem to go anywhere along this circle and create right triangles. Well, the right triangle that's being segmented here is this one. So you've got... 4.32 inches as the hypotenuse value, 
And then this is the adjacent side, this is the opposite side. Now, interestingly enough, if I take the sine value of this to solve this value over here, it comes out to be exactly two over one over 0.864 divided by 10 to the second power plus one, which ends up being 1.023148, which is the exact same value that I showed up earlier when I decided to use one as my radius value. And then when I divide that by 4.2, right? So this is basically 4.2, just under 4.2. It gives me 2.4. So I've got this interesting 24-42 relationship and the prime number pattern is based on 24. Why? Well, because there is a, a math equation that is pi to the power of pi divided by Euler to the power of Euler equals 2.4. So here it is embedded actually in this mathematics of light speed and 432, which is also a tuning standard. It's also the radius of the sun. It's also the number of seconds we have in half of a day of 12 hours, 43,200 seconds. These numbers are all numbers related to geometry and nature and sacred geometry. So here's this Euler over pi giving us a mean value of 0.864. Now, what's interesting here, and I'm going to go longer than the hour today, guys, because um, this is my last class, and I'm just going to have to stop the, the, uh, the Instagram crowd um, and, and then come back. I'll, I'll, I'll get them back on in a second so that we can uh, continue through. We'll be done probably in about, I'd say it'll take probably 90 minutes total. So um, from the beginning of the class, not, not, from now, not from now. So basically, we have Euler over pi, and this is the value of Euler, and this is the value of pi. This is the value of 22 over seven, and this is the value of 19 over seven. Now, I had noticed that there's some relationship of Euler where light is squeaking out just before the Euler number is reached, right? Because this is where light sort of pops out from that zone until right here. And if there's a speed limit on the speed limit of the universe, it's gonna be Euler. Euler controls and, and, and absolutely dictates all wave expansion. And it does it through scalar waves and gravity. So basically we have 2.718 plus 3.1416. So these would be the transcendental values of Euler and pi. That equals, when I multiply Euler times one third plus pi times two thirds, it equals 3.000. That's impressive in itself because I've got two transcendental irrational numbers that through a simple function multiplying in weighted average value by one-third and two-thirds. And why is it one-third, two-thirds? Well, because a tetrahedron that is nested within a sphere will occupy one-third of the volume of the sphere, sphere, and the part that it's not occupying will be two-thirds. So it's dark and light. It's the same thing with hydrogen, right? So uh, you could say that all of the universe is all geometry, and so there's always a relationship that's gonna be occupied like this relates to light. The first light that we see is actually the hydrogen element. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So, but when I use the Archimedean value of pi, 22 over seven, and when I use the Archimedean uh, correlate to Euler, then I do the same calculation and I get exactly three to 11 digits of zeros. That I find very interesting. So the da Vinci circle, circumference of 27.14 minus 2.718218, which would be the actual value of Euler comes out to 2442. Or, or sorry, 20, 27.1436 minus 2.718218 equals uh, 24.42. And then when I take 2.718218 minus 27, 0.1436, that's giving me this leftover value of two zeros, three, nine, four, five, seven, seven. And what that is, it's one over 1.394577, right? Plus two, right, is Euler minus one, or actually just Euler. This, this should, these, these two negate each other. This should just say Euler. Um, and, and Euler minus two comes out to 0.0717 which is another close relationship. You know, it's that 0 0.714, 0 0.718 range, 
right? And this becomes the interest portion. This is what drives interest on calculation for bank interest that you pay when you have daily compounding or monthly compounding or annual compounding, right? And this is giving me, us a correct value for Euler in doing it this way, right? Um, to within 0 0.0011 of Euler. So I had basically uh, worked on Euler and Pi for several months and, and this goes back to 2019, uh, last May. And, and, and so, you know, even Einstein believes that light speed is actually supposed to be three, right? Three times 10 to the eighth power meters per second, not 299,792,458, right? If you want it to be perfect, you should just set the meter to light speed. Well, light speed actually oscillates slightly, right? It changes. Now, light speed also can be derived as high as, it's, it's been measured well above 186,400 miles per second, so 186,600 miles per second, and it's been measured as slow as 186,000 miles per second. And the median uh, is kind of hovering in that zone of 186,282, which is the light speed measurement for vacuum. Um, but if there's, there's great videos online you can find that light speed, and by the way, the light is not actually traveling, it's the wave propagation that's traveling. The best analogy I give to this is, if you're in a stadium and you're, you're at a football game or something and people decide to do the wave, right? The wave doesn't travel around the stadium. Well, the wave is going around the stadium, but you're staying stationary. It's not like you're moving with it. It's the same thing with molecules in the ocean. When, when a water molecule gets excited by a wave, it goes up and it goes down. It doesn't actually travel. It's not like we have a tsunami in Japan and we have the water molecules from Japan showing up on California's shores. They stay in the same spot. It's the wave that's traveling. So this three, if we applied it to meters, would actually become a really perfect measurement for light speed. And that's how Einstein referred to it. He referred to it and he was adamant about it being three times 10 to the eighth power, not the 299. Now, if you took it exactly to three times 10 to the eighth power, that comes out to 186,400 and change miles per second when using miles. So what did da Vinci do? He mechanistically separated light and darkness, revealing knowledge of advanced mathematical physics, constants, uh, transcendental Euler, pi, alpha, right, golden angle, phi, uh, omega, and many more. He identified the mathematical connection between both transverse and longitudinal waves that are gravitationally based, scalar waves. And, and the Kaluza-Klein theory uh, did not do a good enough job explaining to people that are limited to fourth dimensional reality, fourth dimension being time, right? And we tend to separate space and time. Actually, time and space are the same thing. Um, but, but it didn't do a very good job explaining the scalar wave function. And so it wasn't as accepted, but Einstein accepted it. And I'm telling you, it is exactly right on. It also matches perfectly. Everyone loves the mathematics of it because it matches perfectly with, um, with the work of, um, uh, of James Clerk Maxwell in 1860, who used quaternion mathematics to basically prove uh, that electromagnetism was emergent from electricity along with gravitation being emergent from electricity. There's only one force. So people that get stuck on this notion that we've got these four forces, weak force, all that stuff, it's all bullshit, in my opinion. Sorry to the scientific community. But the truth is, uh, and I think it's been very aptly put forward in the Clues of Klein theory, which I went back and read a lot of only in the past few weeks. And, uh, and, and incidentally, I had a long chat with Nassim Haramein last week, and he has also been studying a lot on Clues of Klein just by pure coincidence. He encoded hermetic symbolism and information relating to the Great Pyramid of Ross Tau. Rose Tau. Now, da Vinci, if you go on the Rosicrucian website, uh, is listed as one of the founders of Rosicrucianism, <laughs> which is interesting uh, because he kept referring to it in his, in his letter to the Devatdar of the Sultan of, of Cairo as the Taurus, right? Tauros. And of course, T-A-U-R-O-S is how you say Taurus or bull. Bull Mountain. Now, you may know that uh, on my last trip to Egypt, using the Last Supper, uh, we were able to find eight new stone reliefs inside the king's chamber. And my wife, Susie, actually identified the most significant one, which was a bull uh, that is encased in its mother, Hathor, which represents Omega. Okay, Hathor is the Omega in Egypt, and, and 
the apis bull is the alpha. And the alpha had to sacrifice himself in Egyptian legend for his mother, right? So he sacrificed his ego, his separation for his mother. And there's a beautiful symbology in all of this because it comes back to what the true message that Da Vinci is leaving us here today. And it comes back to that exact same metaphor. He encrypted advanced knowledge of the sun, the moon, the earth, and the universe at large. And he teaches that the divine balance of logos and pathos evolve into super consciousness or ethos. The conscious mind merges with the subconscious mind, enabling the super conscious heart mind experience of the heart brain. He embodied masterfully in this encryption, the true squaring of the circle. And while mathematicians around the world were stuck on this, oh wait, pi is transcendental. We can't have a transcendental that is making you know, the, the, the circle if we're gonna try to match the squares area to it. Well, the funny paradox of all of that is that transcendental Euler is what makes the squares in the first place. So they completely missed the mark. Another case of scientific community learning from the polymaths and then basically pitching it out the window because they get stuck on their reductionistic thinking. And that period of time is over. The educational paradigm in the world today, in my opinion, is over. And it's time to move on to the next level. So here's uh, some, some numbers for you. And actually there's a great presentation that I posted on Instagram that I'd like you guys to, to look at if you haven't seen it yet. And that is by Randall Carson about you know, the, the, the sacred numbers that basically appear over and over and over again in all of our imperial, metrics, uh, imperial measurement system. You know, so I think it'd be a terrible travesty to get rid of our imperial system. And there's a pretty strong system um, that is in place already that we are now starting to ignore as a world, which we need to return back to because it has incredible information in it. And I believe that this knowledge of the universe has been known on the planet for thousands of years and we simply have forgotten and lost it. So basically you have the uh, 2,160 miles of the diameter of the moon, 864,000 miles is the diameter of the sun. Now, have you ever thought about that, that the sun and the moon are exactly 400 times the distance from each other? So the distance from earth to the moon is 400 times closer than the distance from earth to the sun. And also the exact diameter is 400 times difference as well. So this is why we have a perfect eclipse. Because if it weren't exactly 400 times smaller and 400 times closer, we would not see the moon as being the same size as the sun. Have you ever noticed that when you look up at the sky that the moon is generally the exact same size of the sun, except for when it's at its closer part of its orbital trajectory around the earth? It might look a little bit bigger and sometimes looks a little bit farther away, but its mean size from an aspect ratio is identical to that which we see of the sun. And the great solar year, which was first talked of by Plato, is 25,920 years. Now, some say it's 24,000 years because you know, time tends to speed up as we get to the other side of a cycle. And actually, we live in a binary star system, and our other star is Sirius, Sirius A, the very large white star that is the brightest star in our sky. It's actually our second sun. Every star in the universe is probably part of a binary star system or sometime trinary star system, or maybe we just don't even see the patterns that are even bigger than that. But basically we are 8.6 light years away. There's 8.6 again, right? 8.6 light years away from Sirius A. Interestingly also, if you look up right now, the distance from Earth to the center of the Milky Way galaxy, it comes out to be just under 26,000 light years distance. So here's the same 25,920 showing up over and over again. Now I'm gonna stop for just a moment. I'm not going anywhere for the people that are on Facebook. I'm gonna go ahead and stop it for a second here on Instagram so that we can continue this one sec. Okay, we should be good now. All right, so we're back. And, and Facebook, we don't have to do that on. Okay, so this is the equatorial 
diameter of the sun, 864,000 miles. There are 86,400 seconds in a day. Do the math, 24 hours times 60 times 60. The mean diameter of Jupiter is 86,400. The orbital speed of the moon is 86,400 kilometers per day. And the orbital speed of Saturn is 86,000 or 864,000 kilometers per day. Now, do you think someone's trying to tell us something here? <laughs> Secondly, there are 216, right, uh, minutes in the compass. And then, or sorry, 21,600. And then 216 is six times six times six. So six cubed is 216. It's also the sum of angles of a cube, which is 2,160 degrees. Each of the processional periods out of 25,920 years equals, so you just take 25,920, divide that by 12, you end up with 2,160. And then we have 216 uh, 21,600 nautical miles is exactly the equatorial circumference of the Earth. Now, what's interesting about that also is light speed is 186,000 miles per second, 186,400 is the number I like to use. But if you look at it in nautical miles, and I challenge you to go ahead and Google it, it's 161,810. So that's phi. That's the golden number, 16181. So interesting, and what we're really dealing with here is harmonic ratios. So this x-axis and the y-axis is simply placing a table here. This was done by my friend uh, Nala Bursi, who is a, a wonderful mathematician and uh, esoteric geometer as well uh, in Australia who does these great courses online called uh, Sonic Geometry. Uh, uh, sorry, SGD is what it's called. A sonic geometry decoded. And basically, you start with three to the third power, right, times two to the first power. And that gives us, you know, three to the third power is just 27, times two is 54. This is octave doubling. 27 to 54 to 108 to 216 to 432, 864. These are the exact same numbers that we're seeing with the Da Vinci uh, circle right, which was 864, 8.64 inches, okay? And these numbers are the ones we'll see over and over and over again and kind of commit them to memory because they are part of consciousness. They, once they get embedded into your consciousness, you can't unsee them. They'll be everywhere, okay? So the moon does have a radius of 1,080 miles and a, a diameter of 2,160 miles. Now, even the biggest reductionist of scientists would have to look at this and say, how in the heck is this all possible? That's what I'm talking about. The, the stuff that people bitch and complain about and say, oh, the conspiracy, the conspiracy, they're hiding it from us, they're trying to keep everything from us. No, that's complete bunk because the truth is it's been in plain sight. No, it's because we have not perceived it and we have not seen it. So stop blaming somebody else. It's no, no one else to blame but ourselves. And the moon represents the subconscious mind, the darkness, the patho, the pathos, the irrational, and intuition, and all the symbology that we think about for the moon. So the sun, right, the actual diameter matches that on the Da Vinci page, which is 864,000 miles, represents the conscious mind, the logos, and the light. Now the radius, the radius, and that actually means son of God, is 4.32 inches here, but it actually is 432,000 miles, right, for the sun. And it represents the brain, the rational mind, and the masculine. And right down the center, we have the diameter of the Da Vinci circle, which is, um, uh, sorry, the outer circle, which goes all the way up to the top of the moon here, right? Remember the Da Vinci square, and then we exoscribe a, a square that you can still see around this, which is 10 inches by 10 inches. And the Da Vinci square is a diagonal of 10 inches. So as you inscribe circles and squares, the diagonal turns into the side length as you get larger and larger, right? And it goes the opposite the other way. So here we have a value of 10, which is the same as one, it's just a fractal. Now, what about Earth? 
So Gaia, as it is named, it's interesting. We have, we have two feminine archetypes, one being the Earth in Gaia. We have another one in the moon called Luna. And then we have Helios for the sun, which is the man. So why do we have two women and one man, one man in this kind of like interesting structure we have of the solar system? Well, you could actually say that the moon is part of the earth. And what da Vinci is actually trying to tell us here is that, remember, he had this weird sort of offset to show us that this is actually a cube shown in perspective. And the cube is the representation of both the moon and the earth. So the alchemical symbol for the earth is the cube. And no, it's not because it's flat. We don't live in a flat earth and there's no dome. So please forget that. It's just... I actually think that as people ascend into fifth dimensional understanding, there will be an equal number of people, and we, God love them all, but there'll be an equal number of people that will end up descending into the second dimensional from a perspective uh, standpoint. So their perspective will be limited to flat things. It, it's really bizarre, but that's kind of the only way I can kind of reconcile the two things in my mind. Now, if you're arguing that the earth and our experience here is just all a matrix, that's a different discussion. I'll argue that, but still the holograph is a sphere and it's spinning. And yes, water can stay on the planet. It's not like a ball that you pour water on and then the water will spin off. There's something called gravity. So the cube is six to the third power, which equals 216, with interior angles summing to 2160 degrees. The Earth's equatorial circumference is 21,600 nautical miles. And the diameter of Earth itself is 7920. Interesting. So remember that 7920. Now the radius of Earth is 3960. Now, Tesla said all the secrets of the universe are in the numbers 3, 6, and 9. So this is what da Vinci drew on the square right up here. But actually the value at the top of the square is different than the value at the bottom of the square because it literally skews outward. It's not a square. The value at the bottom is 7.18, two inches. You might remember that 7.18 number because that's from the 2.718 of Euler. And the top of the square is 7.07, 106, which is actually one over the square root of two. So this is inside the box. And what is it that Euler does? It controls wave expansion and also moving outside the box cresting out outside of the circle to go at that 4.32 squared number at 13.7 degrees and 76.3 degrees of omega, the alpha omega escaping out of this reference or boundary condition of the circle that da Vinci drew for us. Now, this is also interesting because the arm length here, right, is 7.07, .07, right? But if you extended it down to the bottom, if you were still touching the, the, the tip to tip, it would be 7.18. Now you'll also notice, again, this is what I'm talking about. You see where he made this bulbous line. It's because of this bulbous kind of like point that he made that actually makes this so that this line is exceeded. So if, if it were perfect, it would go like that, right? That's what allows it to exactly touch the spiral of Theodorus. So that is just epic. But, but basically, what is, you know, what is da Vinci trying to tell us here? Well, first of all, there's more analysis to be done here because I believe that there's such thing as just as we have squaring the circle, and I believe that da Vinci has properly squared the circle. You know, the scientific community and mathematicians of the day were looking through the wrong end of the telescope. They didn't understand these advanced relationships. Da Vinci spent 10 years studying this. He saw it as a game, right? It was definitely the hero's gamos in his mind. And as a Rosicrucian as well, they are all about the compass and square and squaring of the circle. By the way, each of these points here at the bottom, I'm doing another analysis on, their degree references are all fundamental messages as well. So if you're wondering what are this, these things down here, from here and from here, these lines are all important degree references. So just stay tuned for that. There's way more on this still. And the three-dimensional measurement would mean that we're gonna be doing uh, sphering of cubes and cubing of spheres. 
and not only in three dimensions, but in hyper dimensions. So the measure of man across from here to here is referred to as the fathom. Okay, so this is one fathom, which is six feet or 72 inches. Now, Alan Green does a great video on this. It's titled CPAC Presentation in 2016. I highly, highly recommend you watch it if you have not yet. It talks about the five and six and how the cubit, foot, and meter are all fundamental relationships that are just inherent to geometry. Nothing being, you know, you would never hide something so that it could not be found. And I'm a cryptographer. You'd never hide something so that no one will ever find it. You hide it so someone will find it. But you're wanting them to go through certain steps of consciousness so that those findings can be had. So the measure of man, the 72, right? The sun plus mankind equals 936. The moon plus man equals 936. The difference being only the position of the decimal point. The earth plus man equals 864. And the earth minus man, right, equals 0.72. Now, this is fascinating stuff for me. What is it really trying to tell us? Well, the Earth's diameter is 7,920 miles. So we have the 7.92, the 8.64, the 2.16, and the 7.2. All of that add up together to 25,920. Hmm. 25,920 is the number of average breaths we take daily. We take a breath about every 3.3 seconds. An average life of 72 years represents 25,920 days. The Earth's precessional period is said to be 25,920 years. That's the Earth's wobble, right? So the Earth is spinning not only one direction, right? Not only is it moving around the sun, that would give it a second direction, but it's a gimbal because on its axis, the axis also spins around. And that cycle takes 25,920 years to complete. And you'll find that referenced by NASA. The speed of light in miles per hour squared, right? So if you take the, the, the speed of light in miles per hour, it's 671 million miles per hour. And that is 25,920 squared. And this value is also 1.61 squared. Golden mean. It's right in the zone of the golden mean, and it relates exactly to time. And, and that is also that 1.6099 is the difference between the, the meter and, or the kilometer and the mile. So what is da Vinci trying to say here? So we've got the moon that represents the, the divine feminine. We have the earth that also represents the feminine. Mother Earth, we never say Father Earth. We say Father Time, and we talk about the sun. So I guess we do have another male in the solar system, and the other male in the solar system is usually Kronos or Saturn. So we have diameter, 10, right? The radius of 432, and the heart brain. What da Vinci is telling us, the action of squaring the circle is bringing the logos the logic of Euler, the square, the rational, to the irrational in equal proportion, in divine balance. That it's not just that we see it in gender, that polarity exists everywhere. It's a condition of the universe. Everything has its equal and opposite. Every action has an equal opposite reaction. Here, the symbolism is the conscious mind merging, the light merging with the dark, sometimes referred to as shadow work. And then as soon as you transcend judgment of others, you transcend judgment of self, and that's the end of judgment. That is the end of judgment. When we talk about the judgment day, it's never about, it should never have been about the concept of of you know, God enacting on us some sort of final judgment. It's the end of that judgment. It's the end of duality. The superconscious mind then takes over. Now, this cycle is a cycle that the earth has been through for many thousands of years. 
And this is the autumnal equinoctial point, right? And we just crossed in 2012, we crossed over the vernal equinox. And so we're now in the spring of mind. We're now, we're now just past seven years. We've just gone through one of, uh, you know, one octave, I guess you could say, of, of uh, you know, a scale of seven notes. It would be like the white keys on the keyboard, not including the black ones. And each of these, and some people say to me all the time, when are you going to talk about astrology? Listen, <laughs> I'm, I definitely believe there's something to astrology. Um, so don't think that I don't, because I definitely do. In fact, I went to study it uh, recently just so I could learn the concepts and precepts of it, because you have the, some of the greatest minds in history, including da Vinci, including, including Johannes Kepler, including, um, you, you name it, um, John Dee, and, and many other polymaths throughout history. There was always this interesting thing that I found was that these incredible scientists and men of philosophy were as much mathematician, as musician, as, philo as philosopher, as astrologer, as any one thing. In fact, they could not be defined as one thing. And I think that's an important message for the world today too, because the educational system is built today around scarcity, economics. The educational system is built around hyper-specialization. And to me, that day is over. We need a totally new educational system. And it's funny when I have more people taking geometry with me online then are probably studying geometry in universities. And we learn geometry when we're in eighth grade. We're not ready to understand the concepts of geometry, even the concept of our education's ending when we come out of graduate school or when we come out of, you know, some advanced degree so we can go into some box like an automaton and be a, a, a freaking robot of specialization. And we learn to stop thinking. Not only do we... Do we not encourage free thinking, but we learn to stop thinking. We learned also at a very early age to stop feeling emotion. I think the real message here for da Vinci and for us from him is that we are all divisions of one. It all just as we saw with the spiral of Theodorus, everything emerges from the number one the illusion of time and the illusion of space are the same thing. They are illusion. There is no space per se. We conceive of it in our mind, so therefore we feel separate and our whole lives are spent experiencing separation until we get to the point that we start to become aware of the darkness. Just as just as Carl Jung references and says, you know, Carl Jung basically says, it's not by illuminating that which is already light that we achieve higher understanding and awareness. It is by becoming aware of the darkness that we achieve higher understanding. But as mathematically, which I've seen now, the one over X value relates to the, it's a DNA of a number. And you'll, you know, we've had a class on this already, so if you'd like to learn more about it, you can go and find it. And of course, I know this is sort of a self-evident equation, right? Which is x times one over x equals one, but everything falls into that. So we have something called the Rydberg constant and from the bohr adam model, which I think needs to be really revisited because it has some genius in it and because Bohr was from Europe at a time that was not popular to be from Europe, and potentially a Nazi sympathizer, you know, the world dismissed the bohr adam model, but for what came out of it, which was the Rydberg constant, which is that light is separated, just as I mentioned, the umbrella outside is not only blue, it's also red. Someone asked me today, they said, oh, why did you use the certain colors that you used on the, the, on, on the picture that I posted along with the Last Supper, as well as Quaternion Symmetry? They said, why, why is it, show up those different colors. And I said, because every note has two colors and they're simply separated along the color wheel, just like this is. Hydrogen emits these lines of color. So this purplish color here, here, and then blue, and then red. You can calculate what that is 
right? And we know when we see these lines of spectral analysis, we can calculate that, that it's actually hydrogen. So that's how we know hydrogen is in the far reaches of the universe. It's the most prevalent of all of the elements in the universe. And it's, of course, the first element. It has one proton and one electron. Maybe there's actually other, and I believe there actually are. There are nine other elements prior to it, but these would be what we call today as hydrinos. And they're beyond our dimension of understanding, but if you look at the wave separation that should occur with expanding waves and with the periodic wave of elements, because there are no tables in the universe, it's all wave-based, then it would say that where hydrogen is, showing up before the carbon octave, which has eight uh, elements in it, and then the next octave, silicone, has eight, and then it goes 17 and 17. We have one of them being an isotope popping out on both of those, and then it goes 32 and 32, and then and that's where we start to recognize all the isotopes as, as being you know part and parcel of the lanthanides and, and canthanides, and, or alkanides, excuse me, and, and so basically what's happening here is we have an X value, we have a one over X value. So in this context, you could say you have U and the inverse U. Or maybe another way to say it is U and the U inverse. U and the U inverse instead of u universe. So all of this here is actually right, it can be quantified mathematically through this Rydberg function, and it can be adjusted for all elements to separate a mirror between x and one over x. We look at the number seven, it's not only the number seven, it's also 0.1428574 infinitely. And yet we only recognize it as seven, we should also be looking at its one over x value. Everyone has their own uniqueness in that context. So that leads us into a world of duality, where you know, the best representation I could think of here is this iceberg. You know, if an iceberg were conscious, does it even know that there's any part of it underneath the water that is the iceberg itself? Let's say the consciousness would be above the water, so it might perceive a boat on the surface of the water. It might also perceive a bird in the air. It could also perceive uh, the sun and the moon. But the subconscious is totally separated and it's separated from a mirror at the surface. And this leads us to an existence of duality, of judgment. And the conscious mind wants nothing to do with the subconscious mind. From the time that we start to experience separation as children, we want to have disdain for the subconscious because that's the side that makes us do bad things. But what if there's really no such thing as good or bad in the first place? And really, it's just that those things that we want to associate with versus those things we don't want to associate with. I don't want to be perceived as a Democrat, so I'm going to be a Republican. I'm, and then whatever it is, if I believe that it will benefit me societally or it's going to benefit me financially or socially or somehow, some way, I'm going to go ahead and side with that because there's really no such thing as ethics. So people will justify whatever it is that they want to justify in whatever context they want to justify it. If they think it will benefit them, we've seen it today. I mean, I, I've never read so much fake news in my entire life, and it's a caricature. It's ridiculous. You watch Fox News, and you have to get equal doses of both sides, otherwise it just kind of seems like a, a joke. So the, the point is that who are we lying to? It's all about motivation on what we believe benefits us. Now, Saul Alinsky, the social agitator, wrote, our world is not a world of angels, rather, it is a world of angles. A world where men speak of moral principle yet act on power principle. A world where we are always moral and our enemies are always immoral. It doesn't matter what it is. We will pick the side. Someone sent this to me today, uh, Robin. 
who works with me, uh, Robin Davis. Here's the good, here's the bad. Here's the bad and the good, and here's the good and the bad, and this is life. There's an ancient Chinese proverb that talks about the man who had a beautiful mare in his paddock. And everyone, this, this horse was the, was the envy of the whole town. And one day the horse somehow got out of the paddock and ran away. And so the old man who lived alone with his son, just the two of them, and they tended their farm, you know, when the townspeople came and said to them, hey, you know, it's really sad that you lost your horse. That's really, that's the worst thing that could ever happen. It was such a beautiful prized mare. And he said, well, if it is good or if it's bad, no one can know. And the next week, um, there was a, uh, there was basically a, 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 a unique situation that came up where all of a sudden a stallion shows up in his paddock, in the same paddock. And somehow the mayor had attracted the stallion because I guess they wanted a mate or something. And so the stallion came back and now is living inside the paddock. And so the townspeople came and said, wow, your old horse, your mayor, your prize mayor came back and, you're, and now you have a stallion too. That's the best thing that could ever happen. You're so lucky. And the old man said, whether it's good or bad, no man can know. So the next month later, the, his son is, is trying to, you know, bridle this, this stallion. He puts a saddle on it and he tries to ride it and the stallion bucks him off and he breaks his leg badly. So this is the only person to help the farmer and the farmer is old. How's he going to tend his farm? So the townspeople come to him and say, oh, this is horrible news. What's happened? You've lost it all now. Now, you know, this, this crazy horse is a curse. It basically bucked your son, broke his leg. And he said, whether this is good or bad, no man can know. Because the next week, the Chinese army shows up and looking for conscriptions because they're going to have a battle. And all the young men are being sent to their deaths because they're going to be right on the front lines. And somehow, because the young boy had a broken leg and he was lame, he got passed over. So the townspeople said, wow, your son is so lucky. And the old man looks at him and says, whether it is good or bad, no man can know. And I think that is a, a really good example of how we can look at our world around us. Everything that happens to us, you know, the coronavirus. What if we change our perception and stop ourselves from thinking this is bad and it's happening to me and say everything that happens in the universe is actually happening for me? Would that change your connectivity to others? Would it change your connectivity to yourself? If you looked at every experience is happening for your benefit and for your ultimate learning, how could it change your world? Da Vinci left us the spiral of Theodorus and encrypted it beautifully for us to find. If he'd drawn it like this, I don't think it would have been the masterpiece that we think of it as today. Everything emerges from the number one. And it's the combination. Of the heart and the mind. That is squaring the circle. This has been such a blessing uh, for me to have this class with you guys. I've really, truly enjoyed it. I've been inspired by all of your drawings and by your work and your comments. And this is such a beautiful message from this great mind, which is exactly left this earth 501 years ago. I hope that you'll continue this journey. I hope that if you want to learn more about this and this ongoing work, that you will uh, visit my website. Uh, all the classes are on there. 
Uh, you can also take my courses on Resonance Academy, Etymology of Number. In there, I teach the alchemical path in addition to the mathematics, but it's really structured. And um, I'll still be here on Facebook and Instagram, of course. So, and I'll still be doing these types of things pretty often and, and posting stuff. I, you know, I do it daily. And Jamie Janover is, uh, is the person who helps me and he does a lot of the posts and everything. He does a great job. But just want you guys all to know that I truly believe that the universe happens for us and that recognizing and embracing the, dar the darker aspects of ourselves and accepting. You know, I gave a TED talk on overcoming fear with gratitude. And it's gotten, you know, millions of views. But I think the message for the world today and the message that Da Vinci is giving us is to replace judgment with acceptance. Have a wonderful day, everyone, and see you soon. Bye.